Okay, well, welcome to our um, webinar on gold and precious metals investing. Uh, our webinars are intended to serve as a forum for the discussion of key areas of interest for investors in ETPs. And today we're focusing on an area of the exchange traded product market that has argued, arguably been the biggest success of all. Gold and precious metal ETPs have opened up uh, bullion investing to the masses in a, in a cost effective way and have attracted tens of billions of dollars of assets. Only a week or two ago, it was reported that GLD, the Spider Gold Trust, had become the largest exchange traded fund in the world. And the collective gold holdings of ETFs and similar trackers have been described as the People's Central Bank, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, I'd like to introduce my uh, co presenters. I I'm Paul Amory, the editor of IndexUniverse.eu and the Journal of Indexes Europe. I'm joined by Suki Cooper, who's Precious Metals Analyst at Barclays Capital, and by Charlie Morris, who's a Director of HSBC Asset Management and an investor in Precious Metals ETPs. The format of the next hour is as following. Suki will spend about 15 minutes sharing her views on the Precious Metals Market Outlook, focusing on all four metals. I'm then going to run through the options for European investors who are uh, choosing between different precious metals trackers. I would like to review the key products available and spend a little time digging it into the structural differences that distinguish uh, between them. And then we'll spend the, the last half hour of the webinar on a discussion of these key points. I I'd like to remind you that webinars work best when they are interactive and uh, we very much welcome your questions. So please ask your, our panelists your questions. You can send your questions in at any time during the next hour. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session. And it's easy to do so. You just click on the question mark icon on the floating toolbar of your web session. Uh, that will open the Q&A window in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You type your question into the small uh, dialog box and press send. And then we'll pass your questions on to the webinar participants. And with that, over to you, Suki. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. The price action across the precious metals has been quite diverse um, in 2011 already. We've seen silver hitting all-time highs at the end of April and then losing rapidly 30% in the space of a week, while gold had a very slow start to the year. And then it actually started to gain traction in July and has scaled successive highs throughout this year. And in contrast, the PGMs have been trapped in a, in a range-bound trade, finding good support at higher levels, but then I'm struggling to gain traction through the upper limit. For the year to date, gold is up almost, um, gold is up around about 34%. Silver is actually the strongest performing precious metal and is up 39%, while platinum is up a modest 7% and palladium is actually down for the year, it's down 5%. We expect this price divergence to continue and we expect gold to find the most support in the near term with silver trading closely behind and the PGMs to tighten towards the end of this year and into 2012 but really struggling to gain traction um, for, uh, um, for the rest of this year. So the chart that, that's shown here really shows how diverse the performance has been with silver being the best performer and the PGMs really struggling to gain traction. So just kicking off with gold, we can see that there's, a, there's an important note here to, to bear in mind, the fact that gold hasn't been dependent on just one factor, it's not been just investment demand. It's actually had a number of structural changes that have supported the prices hitting all-time highs this year and in previous years as well. There's a number of factors ranging from producer hedge book buybacks, from central banks switching from the demand side um, over to the, sorry, switching to the demand side from the supply side, and also the availability of newer investment products such as ETPs providing easier access for investors to gain access to gold. But also the heightened macro uncertainty has reignited demand for gold as a safe haven asset, as a hedge against inflation, as a hedge against market, uh, financial market instability and as a portfolio diversifier. In this slide here we can see exactly how investors have responded to the macro uncertainty. And we believe there are three main factors why gold will continue to hit new highs. Firstly, it is the state of the global economy and the fact that investors have become more pessimistic about the outlook as well. But investors have responded to this macro uncertainty. In the first six months of the year, investment demand was pretty lackluster in gold, but it's actually picked up quite significantly from July. 
The third main factor we think that uh, will support gold prices hitting new highs is the central banks. We've seen um, gold, uh, gold buying actually emerge from new avenues this year. So it's not just the fact that the uh, central banks have flipped over to the demand side, but they're actually buying in sizable quantities. There could be short-term limitations on gold, such as margin requirement hikes, such as scrap uh, supply emerging, or the fact that we're now entering a seasonally so a strong period of physical demand. If we do see weakness on the physical side, these could temper the rally, but given the fact that the macro uncertainty persists, given that investors are responding to this, and also given that the central bank buying continues, we'd expect gold prices to hit new highs. So the weakest month we saw in terms of gold investment demand this year actually materialized in January. And this is where we saw ETP holdings falling by 64 tons. So in this chart, we have the physically backed ETFs. And overlaying that, we have the non-commercial positions in terms of COMEX non-commercial positions also converted into tons as well. And we can see January was a soft month, but in context of the broader picture, it didn't actually weigh upon investment demand that significantly at all. In fact, it's a minor blip. But that investor interest was pretty much stable in the first six months of the year until July. And that's when we saw the exchange traded products picking up momentum and also the non-commercial positions gaining traction as well to hit all-time highs across those two forms of investment demand. So the investor environment has returned more positively towards gold and that has supported upward momentum in prices. The, the third most important factor is the central banks. They had been quite sizable sellers of gold, certainly in the first part of the last decade, and that really changed in 2009 where we saw fresh buying emerge. Obviously, the IMF sales contributed quite significantly to that, but previous to that, the central banks had been sellers of around about 400 tons each year. But that changed, and we saw the European Central Banks actually selling less under the European Central Bank um, agreement. And so far this year, they've struggled to sell even a ton of gold. And in contrast, we've actually seen buying emerge elsewhere. We know Russia's been a, a rather consistent buyer of gold since um, 2006, but we've seen other central banks emerge as buyers. We saw India buy from the IMF uh, a sizable 200 tons of gold. We've seen Sri Lanka buying, Central Bank of Mauritius buying. And this year we've seen interest emerging from South Korea and Mexico and Thailand. So we've seen a range of new countries entering the field as a potential new opportunity uh, for new demand to emerge. So we've seen a number of structural changes in the gold market that have really supported the, the, the price gains that we've seen. So the, a couple of factors that I mentioned that could temper the gold price rally were the scrap supply side and the jewelry demand. But we think it's the physical side of the market that really sets the floor for prices. And this is particularly evident in, 1990, in the 1990s where it Gold is really behaving as a commodity rather than behaving as a currency. And it was here the physical side of the market, i.e. jewelry demand, that set the floor for prices. The price action was less volatile and prices were really testing their floors. If that physical demand was no longer present in the market now, then we would say that the gold prices are actually more vulnerable, a bit like their sister metal silver. But because that physical demand continues to emerge at increasingly higher and higher levels, the price is actually much better supported. The shape of the gold demand picture for gold has changed significantly over the past 10 years. Investment demand had made up less than 10% at the first part of the last decade, and jewelry demand making up the bulk of demand. But this year and over the last couple of years, we've seen jewelry demand falling closer to half of gold's end use and investment demand making up an increasingly larger share. But that jewelry demand hasn't disappeared completely. And we've seen at the start of this year, the jewelry demand was emerging at dips towards $1,300 per ounce. And as the year has progressed, we've seen that jewelry demand emerging at increasingly higher and higher levels. Most recently, we've seen that demand emerging at $1,500 per ounce. If that demand hadn't come in to support prices, gold prices would be much more volatile, struggling to find support on the downside. But even though gold prices are at record levels, we're still seeing that interest emerging from China and from India as well. In terms of the scrap market, this is another good indicator on the physical side. 
the scrap market is very sensitive to prices and to price volatility as well. Now, if prices, if the market had been pricing in all-time highs in terms of scrap, uh, in terms of gold prices, we'd see scrap supply surging. But scrap supply has actually been a little bit soft, implying that that market is actually expecting higher prices as well. We saw the strongest level in terms of scrap supply emerging in the first quarter of 2009, where there was a lot of distressed selling of gold, and that was the record quarter. But we struggled to match that record level ever since Q109. Scrap <coughs> supply has remained at good levels, but it hasn't hit new all-time highs. So in that respect, the physical market right now is very supportive for gold. We're seeing good demand emerging, but we're also seeing supply side struggling to keep pace with the strength we're seeing on the demand side. The other opportunities for supply come from the mine, mining sector, where we are seeing some growth, but the sort of growth level is up to 2% on an annual basis, rather than the sort of level of, in terms of growth we're seeing on the demand side. The other source of supply comes from the central banks, and as we've discussed already, we've seen the central banks switching to the demand side, which leaves scrap supply as your third and potentially only side of the supply equation that can respond to higher prices. So overall, the physical picture for gold still looks very supportive, and the investment demand, which is at the moment very responsive to the macro environment, that lends to higher prices for gold as well. Turning to silver, this, this uh, would say is the precious metal that has the least fundamental support and is also the, the precious metal that we think is going to be the most volatile going forward. Silver is likely to benefit from gold's positive momentum and its positive investor attributes, but its own supply and demand dynamics are actually very weak. We've seen silver mine supply hit a record high in 2004 and it's hit successive record highs every single year since. Silver is quite different to the other precious metals and to other commodities generally, in that we're not seeing a picture of deteriorating ore grades, we're not seeing um, producers struggling to replenish reserves either. And in turn, we actually expect mine supply to continue to grow. And even scrap supply last year hit a record high, and we believe that scrap supply is likely to remain positive as well. But Given the supply picture, we're not pessimistic in terms of demand. We've actually seen um, industrial demand continuing to grow, but it's not growing at a pace that's likely to absorb supply, which means silver, more so than, more so than gold, is very dependent on investment demand. And we can see on the chart on the right-hand side how hefty outflows in terms of the ETFs meant that the surplus in the silver market was exacerbated. Overall, we think the silver market is likely to gain some momentum on the back of positive investor interest, but given that it's a market that remains in surplus, and we've seen this year how dependent it is on investment demand, we think it's more vulnerable to downside risks. In contrast to gold and silver, we think the PGMs have struggled this year. We've seen prices struggling to gain traction, and that's really on the back of the demand concerns that have materialized following the events in Japan and concerns over the state of the global economy as well. But the supply picture is also one that shouldn't be ignored. Bulk of the supply for platinum comes from South Africa, and here we continue to see a raft of issues weighing upon the market, whether it's the biannual wage negotiations that are taking place, whether it's the safety-related stoppages, or whether it's trying to secure the power supply from ESCOM in terms of being able to increase its infrastructure capacity to meet the demand in terms of production. So the supply side shouldn't be ignored, especially for platinum. But the demand side, we don't believe there'll be an aggressive increase in terms of auto demand, but we do believe that there is continued growth that's likely to support the underlying picture as we continue to see tighter emissions legislation implemented around the world, and as we see um, new legislation being implemented in various countries that are supporting heavy-duty diesel trucks as well. This is likely to support platinum. In terms of palladium, we continue to see substitution of platinum in diesel vehicles that's likely to support demand. But also the gasoline markets in key countries continue to grow. We're still seeing a good recovery in North America, and we're still seeing some growth coming out of China as well, which is likely to support the gasoline demand for palladium. 
So ultimately, the demand picture we believe remains healthy, not overtly positive, but it does remain healthy. And given the limitations on the supply side, we believe both of these market fundamentals remain constructive. Of course, the one caveat for palladium is the Russian state stock supplies, which have in the past kept the market in a sizable surplus. But we believe that these stocks, estate stock releases are likely to fall, and in turn, as they do, we believe the palladium market is likely to tighten very, very quickly and move into a deficit. Overall, in terms of both platinum and palladium, the investment flows have played a key role in that for platinum, it's reduced the surplus that may have materialized in 2009 and 2010, and importantly for palladium in 2010, the increase in terms of physically backed ETFs actually balanced out the Russian state stock releases of a million ounces in 2010. So the ETFs have played a vital role. So far this year, we've seen platinum ETF flows hitting 200,000 ounces and palladium ETF flows falling by 196,000 ounces. So these are two factors that could swing the balance for platinum or palladium. But beyond any near-term repercussions from the ETF flows, we believe both platinum and palladium markets are likely to move into deficit in 2012, if not towards the end of 2011, creating a much more supportive base and allowing the prices to gain traction. So overall, we remain positive across the complex, but we believe price action is likely to be quite diverse, with gold being the most supportive in the near term, silver being the most vulnerable and the most volatile precious metal, but the PGMs really starting to gain traction in 2012. With that, I will now hand you back over to Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Suki. Uh, for the remainder of the um, pre-question and answer session, I'd like to um, run through the available exchange-traded products for investors in Europe who want to access precious metals. I'm going to start by looking at uh, a brief overview of assets under management in the major trackers. Then I'm going to start, uh, uh, I'm going to review the way that uh, precious metals trackers are named because there's some uh, quite confusing differences in, in naming conventions. Uh, and then move on to look at differences in legal structure uh, and other things which distinguish the uh, available trackers for European investors. After that, we'll turn to our question and answer session. Let's start by looking at the holdings of gold exchange traded products. Uh, these figures are taken from the World Gold Council at the end of July. You'll notice that um, the by far the biggest tracker in the world is the uh, Spider Gold Trust, also known as GLD, uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which has uh, over 40 million troy ounces in holdings, or had on the 20th of July, and I think that still remains the case. And based upon this morning's gold price, I know it's been jumping around today with the Swiss Central Bank intervention, uh, but it's at, a, at a gold price of $1,900 a troy ounce, that takes you to over $75 billion worth uh, in holdings in that single uh, exchange-traded fund. Uh, after that, uh, f after GLD, five of the six other largest uh, gold trackers in the form of exchange-traded products worldwide come from Europe, uh, and, and the other one of the top six is the iShares IAU, also listed in the U.S. Uh, I mentioned earlier that some people have called um, gold ETPs the, the people's central bank, in other words, the backing for people's savings. It's, it's interesting to note that uh, the collective holdings of gold ETPs, you can see from this page, that it's uh, over 70 million troy ounces worldwide. That places gold ETPs sixth in the list of official gold holdings. The U.S. government tops the list with uh, over 260 million troy ounces, based upon figures from the end of last year. Uh, then you go down to Germany at 109 million. The IMF has 91 million. Italy and France have uh, between uh, 70 and 80 million. And gold ETP has come next in the list, also with over 70 million. So it's a very substantial uh, amount of uh, holdings in, in gold bullion that those trackers collectively have. Looking at European gold exchange traded products, you'll notice that there are four big trackers in the European region. That one is uh, from ZKB, ZKB, the largest one, Zurich Cantonal Bank, based in Zurich. Uh, they have about 28% uh, of the European tracker market. That's followed by two ETF securities products, ETFS Physical Gold, also known as PHAU, uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange, its primary listing with 18%. Uh, the same firm's gold bullion securities, 
and uh, an ETF from Julius Baer, the Swiss bank. But beyond those top four, there are five more trackers with holdings worth in excess of a billion dollars from Zetra Gold, Credit Suisse, Source, UBS, and Deutsche Bank. So there's a substantial uh, volume of assets in all these uh, tracker products. Looking at silver, you'll notice that uh, in the tra silver tracking market in Europe, there's one big fund, which is ZKB's silver ETF, which has almost two-thirds of the, the market, uh, nearly, two, nearly $3 billion under management out of a total of nearly $5 billion. ETF Securities and Julius Baer, the same firms as we saw before, also have large trackers, and there are a number of uh, slightly smaller uh, tracker products. Moving to Palladium, this is a much smaller market, as you can see from the figure at the bottom of the page. It's under a billion dollars uh, worth in holdings. ETF Securities Physical Palladium is the largest one, followed ZKB, uh, and then Julius Baer and Source have, uh, have trackers of a slightly smaller size and a few other products in the market. And finally, uh, Platinum. ETF Securities Physical Platinum and ZKB Platinum ETF are the largest two trackers. Uh, holdings in total in Europe of platinum via ETPs are just short of uh, $2 billion. So let's, let's talk about naming conventions because this is something that uh, can be confusing. A lot of people don't pay any attention to it. It could actually be uh, important. So let's just review why things are called uh, different names. F first of all, um, it's, it, there's an important uh, point to make about European Union uh, um, tracker products. In Europe, the word exchange traded fund or ETF, or the words exchange traded fund or the word ETF uh, can't be applied to a precious metals tracker. Uh, and that's because uh, uh, under Europe's uh, USITS rules, uh, a fund cannot hold a single uh, commodity. It's, it, it would be in breach of the diversification rules. Also, uh, EU bars of uh, uh, use its um, funds from holding physical commodities directly in any case. Whereas in the in the U.S. Uh, under the grant of trust uh, structure, which is a uh, has, has been brought in in compliance with the 1933 Securities Act, you can have a fund investing in a single uh, precious metal. Uh, and in Switzerland, there's a similar setup under the the fund rules there. So notice the difference in terms of uh, structure and in, in terms of ownership rights. In the U.S. and Switzerland, you've got a, a fairly standard collective investment fund structure where an investor's stake in the, in the metal concerned is proportional to the number of shares owned. Under the ETC or ETN or ETP structure, you've got a slightly more complicated uh, um, setup. You, you, you have a special purpose vehicle which is, issues a debt, debt instrument, and then the rights to the ownership of the metals are assigned to a security trustee who then holds them on the investor's behalf. Now, when it comes to how these products actually track, this may not seem to make any difference, but they are structural differences between the different trackers that it's worth being aware of. And it's also worth remembering that when, when it, we talk about commodity exchange traded products in general, there are a large number of uh, ETPs that, that track uh, futures contracts or indices based upon commodity futures, uh, and that includes uh, ETPs covering several different commodity sectors. Where there, whereas there are really only two categories that have underlying physical holdings, one of which is precious metals ETPs, the other more recently introduced is industrial metals ETPs. Uh, it's worth uh, also mentioning that, that of the commodity ETP market in general, in Europe, precious metals ETPs are by far the most important category, and I think gold by itself is over 70% of all commodity ETP holdings. So what distinguishes between the different trackers? Well, as I've mentioned a couple of slides earlier, there are differences in legal structure between trackers in different jurisdictions. There are differences, potential differences in, in the way custodial relationships are organized, in other words, where the metal underlying the ETC or ETF is held and by whom. There can be differences in terms of the form of metal holdings, whether metal is held on an allocated or unallocated basis, something, that, something I'll come on to uh, shortly, and what type of metal bars are being held. There can be differences in terms of a physical redemption option, whether that's presence or not. In other words, whether you as an investor can take your ETF or ETC and actually convert it into the metal your uh, ETF is tracking. Clearly, the fees are not uniform across different products. There can be differences in terms of tradability, uh, on different ex whether that's on different exchanges, in terms of the number of market makers present. And finally, uh, and, and importantly, your precious metals tracker may be denominated in different currencies. In other words, not all uh, Precious metals ETPs are denominated in dollars, which is the common way of referring to precious metals prices. 
You can also buy them in sterling, in euros, and Swiss francs. That's just a denomination of the of the uh, ETP. But also, some trackers have uh, an inbuilt currency hedge, which is a slightly more complicated structure. You own the precious metal, but then you also have a hedge from one uh, currency into another. We'll come on to some of these points in a minute. So what we've done on this uh, page and the following one is to look at seven ETPs and trying to, uh, by doing so, we aim to throw light on some of these uh, questions. We've, we've taken a, a selection of the uh, ETPs uh, listed in Europe. We've taken the largest ones that we referred to earlier, and, and, and we're looking specifically at gold. We've also taken uh, Zetra Gold, which is a, a popular uh, tracker product in Germany, uh, particularly, uh, and the Credit Suisse uh, Swiss, Swiss based ETF, and uh, more recently launched iShares Physical Gold ETC. We've just taken them as a, as a cross section of products. Uh, there's no recommendation involved. Uh, we just want to look at differences. So, looking at fees, first. First of all, you'll notice that across the, the larger products, ZKBs, the ones offered by ETF Securities, Julius Baer, it's a pretty standard uh, fee of around 40 basis points, which actually gets deducted from your performance. So that means over time your entitlement to the metal uh, drops, and it drops uh, on a straight line basis, reflecting the deduction of a, of a fee. Zetra Gold has a very different uh, setup. It doesn't charge fees within the structure, but you have to pay a custodial fee, which amounts to pretty much the same uh, thing, but it's payable on the side. So you have to pay it uh, via your custody account, but there's no drop in metal entitlement. You'll see on the right-hand side that the uh, recently launched iShares ETC has uh, come in at a slightly lower fee, and they're obviously trying to gain assets on that basis. Looking at the custodial relationships, uh, in some cases they are the same entity that's issuing the ETF or ETC, and in some cases, in other cases, they're a third party. Note under listing venues the differences in, in listing policy. Some of them are co concentrating on one exchange only, so this, this two of the Swiss products are listed in Switzerland only. Uh, Zetra Gold is a, is, a, is a product that's traded on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, but the ETF Securities products and the, and the Credit Suisse uh, ETF have a policy of cross-listing across different exchanges, so the issuers have taken different uh, uh, routes there in terms of uh, trying to gain assets and attract investors. Under market makers, you can see, again, there's quite a significant difference between the products that have one official market maker or a small number of official market makers and those that have a large number. Currency denomination, some uh, or the majority of trackers have got uh, a choice there. You can decide in which currency you want to buy your uh, gold tracker. But the ZKB uh, gold ETF and the Julius Baer gold ETF, as well as the Credit Suisse ones, have options to hedge your currency exposure from dollars into other, another currency, into Swiss francs, euro, or, or sterling. Here, we, on this slide, we're looking a little bit deeper into structure and what these funds actually hold and how the redemption uh, option works. And so all, all the seven ETPs that we've uh, reviewed have the option to take physical redemption, but the, the, the option is not worded in the same way for uh, each, um, e each tracker. First of all, you'll notice that most of the ETPs offer you a redemption option in multiples of, of what's called an LBMA, that's London Bullion Market Association Standard Bar, which is around 12.5 kilograms or around 400 troy ounces. Now, in dollar terms, given the rise in the gold price, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty large amount. It's certainly out of the reach of any retail investor. It's between 660 or $800,000, depending on the size of the LBMA bar, but let's say seven or $800,000. So if you want to take physical redemption, you have to ask for a multiple of that uh, dollar amount. So it's, this is really a, an option that's restricted for institutions and authorized participants. And you'll see that under the physical redemption uh, option wording, in some cases, such as for ETF securities, physical gold, only authorized participants can use that physical redemption facility. In other cases, uh, Zetra Gold is probably a good contrast. You can actually take delivery in much smaller amounts, uh, and including you know, retail-sized uh, holdings. Let's have a look at the form of, hold, of, of uh, gold holdings. You'll notice that uh, there are, again, m most, most holdings are in the form of LBMA bars, but there are some differences in wording. So in certain cases, ETPs invest exclusively in LBMA bars. In, in other cases, there's uh, there's some other options. So the Julius Baer physical gold ETF has at least 90% in LBMA bars, but it can hold uh, the remaining 10% of its gold in, in another form. The Zetra Gold tracker has a minimum, minimum of 95% in LBMA bars, but 
up to 5% in so-called gold delivery claims against a gold refiner called Umicor. So these are differences to be aware of. And it's in terms of the, whether the underlying bar list is published, uh, again, issuers differ to the extent, uh, in the extent to which they provide this information. So this is a, perhaps a, a useful due diligence checklist that we've uh, put together uh, and how investors might uh, compare and contrast between these particular structures. Uh, when it comes to, the, I think the first point to, to point to be aware of is how the physical gold ETF in this case or ETC, ETC is actually created and redeemed and what counterparty exposures may arise. There's a, an important difference to be aware of between so-called allocated and unallocated gold. Allocated gold is, is a fully segregated holding of gold uh, where the custodian allocates particular bars of gold uh, with specified bar numbers, weights, and fineness for the particular tracker. Unallocated gold is basically a promise by the custodian to uh, hold on the investor's behalf a, a particular amount of gold, but in the event of something happening uh, to the custodian, the holder of that unallocated gold position is and ends up as an unsecured creditor of that particular institution. So clearly, allocated gold gives you a much greater level of protection and in, in pretty much all cases, there, the, the, the majority of holdings of these gold trackers are in allocated gold, but there can be differences in the extent to which uh, holdings pass through an unallocated form during creation and redemption. And you need to check the wording of different tracker prospectuses to uh, look at the details of how that works. In certain uh, trackers, the issuer will only uh, give out the securities of, of the ETF or ETC once gold has been transferred into an allocated account of the custodian. In other cases, uh, it's sufficient for the metal to arrive in an unallocated account for securities to be released. And you should also look at what happens on redemption, how gold is actually processed, and to what extent unallocated gold exposures can occur. Now, in most cases, this, is a, uh, this results in usually only intraday exposures to the custodian, so perhaps it's not a major concern. But uh, if you look on the internet and the debates about uh, different gold tracker products, this is something that has, has certainly attracted a great deal of attention, and it's worth uh, looking into and being, a, being aware of how uh, the creation and redemption mechanism works. As far as custodian and sub-custodian arrangements are concerned, again, it's important to check the language in the, in the fund prospectus. Uh, the, the Swiss gold ETFs, generally speaking, uh, restrict the holding of the gold to locations in Switzerland, either at the bank issuing the ETF or at the designated sub-custodians. Other trackers tend to hold their gold in, in London, but then again, the wording can differ in different uh, prospectuses when it comes to how much gold can be held through a sub-custodian network or whether gold is held at the main custodian. And it's good to check that to be aware of what custodial relationships are in place and how liability is uh, defined between sub-custodian and, and custodian. As far as insurance con is concerned, I, I, I think it's fair to say that the majority of gold trackers do not offer a separate form of insurance. Some, I think, do to a limited extent. Uh, but the, I mean, I, I, I tend to view this as coming under the general aspect of custody. So you, you need to look at who the custodian is and check, it, uh, you know, check their experience and their ability to operate in that area of the market. But it's, uh, if you have an extra provision of insurance, that's perhaps a benefit. But uh, uh, insurance as a whole may, may uh, be folded into the question of custodian relationships. And if, you, if your tracker is using currency hedging, it's important to be aware that the hedging itself ca uh, will create uh, some counterparty risk exposures to uh, individual financial institutions that are giving uh, hedges to the fund. Now, in, it, it, it's made clear in the prospect prospectuses of the relevant products that the, any such hedging-related counterparty risks should be confined to the relevant share classes of the ETF, but that's not a contractual obligation in, in, of the issuer. And it's in, you know, in, in extremis, uh, there could be some transfer of, uh, of risk from the hedge classes to the non-hedged. Again, it's important to check the uh, wording there. And a final thing to look at, tradability. Well, I think it's fair to say that um, gold ETPs are amongst the most heavily and, and uh, heavily traded and amongst the most liquid exchange traded products in, in Europe. Here, here we've taken some figures from the most recent uh, Deutsche Bank uh, ETF market review, and you can see that uh, I think four of the top, top six most traded ETPs in Europe in the week ending the 26th of August, which is the most latest report 
uh, the latest reports were uh, gold ETPs. ZKB gold ETF was number two. ETF security physical gold was three. Gold bullion securities was five. Julius Bears physical gold fund uh, number six. So four of the top six were gold trackers. Uh, Zitra Gold comes in at 14, again, one of the most liquid uh, uh, exchange traded products in Europe. And what does that mean in terms of trading costs? Well, here we've done an analysis of uh, time-weighted uh, bid-ask spreads using statistics that are available on the London Stock Exchange and the Swiss Exchange websites. And we've taken the last uh, three uh, trading weeks to look at the average bid-offer spreads for, for uh, six of the ETPs in our comparison. And you'll see that um, the uh, ETPs with the tighter spreads were ETF Securities Physical Gold and Gold Bullion Securities. The other gold trackers from the table a couple of slides ago had spreads of between 13 and, and 40 basis points. So when measuring your total cost of ownership of the relevant ETPs, this is something also to bear in mind. And you should look at it in tandem with uh, management fees. Before moving on to our q and I'd like to remind listeners that we have a, another webinar coming up next Thursday on a, on a hot topic of uh, 2011, how regulation is affecting ETFs. That's being held at the same time as this webinar on Thursday, the 15th of se September. And with that, uh, I'd like to move on to our Q&A. Um, perhaps I could start with a question for you, uh, Suki. Um, what um, would you say to the people who argue that gold is in a, a bubble? Because clearly we've had a very substantial rise. I think it's up uh, eight or nine years in a row, and we've seen a lot of uh, uh, money coming into the bullion market in the last few months. I'd say with gold, it's, you can't just view it as a commodity. You can't just look at the supply and demand dynamics. In that respect, I think when gold either, either behaves as a commodity or it behaves as a currency. And in the 1990s, it was behaving exactly as a um, a, a commodity and that was when supply and demand was very important but right now it's behaving as a currency and we have a market that's in a fundamental surplus and that surplus is very much being absorbed by the investment demand and in that respect we have to look at gold as a currency instead and in that case it's the macro environment that becomes much more important um, in terms of determining gold prices. If we hadn't seen the structural changes in the gold market, such as producer hedge fund buybacks, such as central banks switching to the other side, I'd say prices were much more unsupported and more vulnerable to downside corrections like we've seen in silver. And I'd say with silver, that was more like a bubble rather than gold prices. But I'd say for gold, there's a number of structural supportive factors in place that are supporting prices at current levels. So I'd, I'd treat it more as a currency. So you're basically saying gold, gold, is, gold is not in a bubble, in, in your I'd, no, opinion? I'd, no, I'd say it's, it's behaving as it should do, given the macro environment. Charlie, what do you say to that uh, question? On the, on the question of gold versus silver, well, I, well, I agree with um, Siki's fundamental thoughts on the idea that you know, gold is a serious one and um, uh, you know, silver is a speedboat that definitely has high volatility. Um, but that high volatility can be a good thing. And you know, uh, a study of the gold-silver ratio, which you can take back hundreds of years, um, shows that you know, 100 is very bad news. You know, 100 um, <coughs> gold worth 100 times the value of silver per ounce. Obviously, it's very bad news for silver. But the, the top of bull markets, you know, we've seen before, um, going back right back to the 14th century, Team, team figures, you know, below the number 20. Right now we're about 44, and so I think there's the opportunity if, um, you know, silver gold ratio went to historic um, lows, then I think that we could see three times performance from silver over gold in this bull market. I also think that silver will capture the imagination um, of the general public much more so than gold, because I think, you know, um, pr pretty feeble reason, but, but none other than it has a lower price, and I think that tends to attract people much more um, than, than some of the other metals, which are much more expensive. Now, um, I would also say that, you know, is this market a bubble? Um, looking at the gold ETPs, I was quite glad to see all your, your combined numbers of all the ETF holdings of physical gold around the world come to the same as the market capitalization of Vodafone. And the, all the silver in the whole world comes to the same market capitalization as British Airways. So I think that we're actually um, a long, long way from a bubble. And I think there are many intellectuals out there who still can't bear the idea of, uh, of gold. It's seen as um, having no utility and so forth. And I think that the of this market is when uh, it starts to become respectable in the mainstream investment community, and I don't think we're anywhere near that point. Charlie, and, and another question for you, if I may. We've, had, we've got a, um, one from one of our attendees. Um, is that 
you know, regular comments from uh, people you know, who are concerned about the security of uh, gold holdings in, uh, in ETFs. And, and the particular question is, why haven't GLD, the Spider Gold Trust, and HSBC, which I think is uh, GLD's custodian, uh, been able to eliminate the mistrust regarding the audits of physical gold in, in GLD? Um, the first point is, this is conspiracy on the internet, and they're always going to have a conspiracy on the internet, and we've tried to tackle some of these things in the past. I've visited the vaults and seen the gold of GLD, and I know it's there. The particular documentary, I spoke to our gold desk yesterday just to make sure I had their, um, their, their up-to-date answer to this very question, and the documentary, which I've never seen, followed the, a bar of gold that was mined in South Africa and came back to our vault um, in London. I can't disclose the location of that secret. But nonetheless, um, a bar of gold was held up to, to the camera. It had a number on it, and that number was nothing to do with GLD. We have many, many customers in our vaults um, in London and elsewhere, um, and that particular bar was nothing to do with GLD, and so therefore, therefore it was not shown in the audit. Right. So, I mean, if people are not happy with that, I guess they can, they can, I mean, they can Well, they can't come and look at it because it's a top, it's a, it's yeah. a top security yeah. um, facility. So, um, yeah. you know, it's not open to the public to go and play with the stuff. It's a very serious business, uh, this kind of custody yes. arrangement. And, um, you know, I, I've been in this bank for 13 years. I think we've got the most stringent internal auditors I've ever seen. You can tell that by the way HSBC's behaved in this banking crisis compared to every other bank in Europe. And, um, you know, the integrity of this bank is sound. I mean, Suki, perhaps I, mean, I could turn this over to you. That the, the um, I mean, gold investors certainly have a long memory, and, and people do uh, remember that uh, in 1933 that the uh, U.S. government confiscated private gold holdings, and that seems to have been part, a reason for part of, part of the reason for the success of uh, Swiss-based gold trackers, because people want to have their gold custodied in, in Switzerland. What, what do you say to these to these concerns over ownership, where the gold is held, in what form it's held, and how important is that from your perspective? We've definitely seen a shift in the way investors choose to hold gold. Initially, there was a uh, preference to hold in the physically backed gold, despite where that product was listed or whether the vault was, held, um, was keeping the gold as well. Then we started seeing a shift towards preference of holding coins instead of the uh, ETF. And as you said, we saw a shift towards the Swiss products as well. We've I think there is a greater shift to holding allocated bars because there is that element of distrust, but the general interest in gold hasn't slowed down. So we're seeing much more broader appetite for gold, and there, and there has been that shift. But one thing that we always highlight is that the, all the products are audited and there are clear statements and prospectuses on the individual websites highlighting the fact that the metal is held on an allocated basis uh, rather than an unallocated basis. And what about the option to take physical delivery, Suki? What have you seen? I mean, there was a, a well-known case, uh, I think, a year or two ago when a hedge fund bought GLD and then converted its GLD holdings into the metal itself. What types of uh, investor practices are you seeing uh, when it comes to using the physical delivery option? I think the investors who are comfortable with holding the physically backed ETFs there isn't um, necessarily a desire to take physical delivery. But having said that, if the investor base is interested in holding uh, the physical product, they do tend to go for an allocated uh, basis holding instead of going for an ETF. We've seen um, in terms of um, investor exposure, there is more of a shift towards the physical product because we've seen the effective positions in terms of COMEX nowhere near the record high. That was hit back in December 2009 when India bought the gold from the IMF. So the, the speculative positions, i.e. the futures exposure, that's slowed down a little bit. Even open interest has come off its highs as well. But the physical demand is, is where we've seen the most amount of growth. And, and, and Charlie, coming back to you, how do you, um, based upon some of the issues we've outlined earlier, how do you select a precious metal striker? What's the most important thing for you when looking at the different options available in Europe? Well, going back to that earlier question, number one thing is integrity. I want it to be physical. Um, I'll never take delivery because I think it's deeply inconvenient for, for, for the business that I run to actually have physical gold. We much prefer to own um, ETFs. That's why they've been, you know, ETFs have been successful because they simplify a complex process. Um, but I think the ability to have delivery um, is nice. It's a bit like having a Range Rover in London. You don't need it, but it's quite fun to have. And um, I think you know, the ability to know that if you want those gold bars to turn up on your doorstep, they could do. Um, <coughs> so, so I think that physical, that, that, that point's you know, important. I also think aftermarket liquidity, tax efficiency, um, and reasonable management fee. They don't need the lowest fee, but just um, you know, a, a reasonable fee, and, and, and all those, you know, those factors um, will do fine.
A question from one of our listeners. Has uh, you, Suki, or you, Charlie, have a view on the uh, gold mining stock ETFs as opposed to gold uh, ETPs? Sure. Do you want me to take that one? Yes, um, please. Yeah, and I think the the point about the the, the gold mining shares, um, that they they haven't in aggregate increased their profit from like, between 2004 and 2008. So the market was actually right. If, if you think all the market's doing is actually um, forward look, you're looking at forward looking profits. Well, between those years, the gold the gold companies in aggregate didn't manage to grow earnings, which is extraordinary. And um, <coughs> but since 2008, those earnings have been going through the roof. So I think what we're now seeing is a massive catch up from gold shares um, over gold. I think gold shares have never been so cheap against gold. You have to go back to the 90s when gold was in a bear market. Um, and I think yeah. the analysts have just come back from their summer holidays and they're way behind the curve um, in doing their earnings estimates. And so I think what we're going to see now is a very strong move in the Huey, the, the AMX Gold Bugs Index. Um, and, yeah. and, I, and, and I think they're, uh, they're a buy. Also, you know, most mines don't tend to be in dollar land. When we talk about gold price, we tend to think about dollars. Obviously, if, if you're a business, then, then the, your costs are in the country that, you, that you're digging and, and, and your, your sale is in dollars. And so actually, if that country's got a strong currency, that's not a good thing. Um, mm. but, but, you know, what the Swiss, the Swiss have done this morning, I think it's really confirmed that the cap is on currency appreciation around the world. Um, and, and, and the dollar out now um, is, is prepared to rally. And what we've seen is a gold price, um, very, you know, today particularly, um, have, have a sort of all-time high breakout um, with a coinciding with a strong dollar. That's very, very bullish for mm. the gold mining shares. Mm. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Suki, any, any views on gold equities as opposed to gold mining equities as opposed to physical gold holdings? I'd say, in terms of the mining stocks, they, they, it's, it's a, a much more different market in terms of the amount uh, of investment in the space as well. But it's the cost base that's been quite troublesome for a lot of the producers, um, given the, the, co the cost of capital and also the inflationary cost and the cost of um, the underlying consumables as well. So it's been quite a diverse performance in that respect. And we've been positive on gold given its investment attributes. So that's not necessarily something that's going to benefit the miners. But having said that, um, I look at the underlying commodities rather than the stock, so I, I wouldn't be able to recommend. Uh, okay, that follow-on question for you, if I may. You've talked about uh, gold increasingly being viewed as a currency. How far are we from uh, the point where a country does back its currency with gold? There have been rumblings to that effect out of China, I believe, and uh, the Russians have talked about it. Are we going to see a, a return to the gold standard anywhere in the next uh, decade? It's not something that we hold as a base case scenario just simply because there isn't enough gold in the world to be able to support uh, and move back to a gold standard as such. Um, but we have seen the um, re-evaluation of gold or re reigniting its relevance as a monetary asset certainly in the last four or five years. And that is much more important for the gold price, in fact, because we, we are seeing central banks moving towards wanting to hold gold again, and those central banks that could sell gold are not selling gold in the central bank gold agreement. Hmm. It, Charlie, you, you, you mentioned gold and silver. What about the other uh, two precious metals, platinum and palladium? Do you look at those uh, as investment opportunities as well? I don't actually. I think that you know, we, we've owned platinum in the past. I wouldn't look at palladium because the liquidity is too low. I think it's an interesting mm -hmm. alternative uh, sometimes in the cycle. But it, you know, the most stable um, commodity is one with a large above ground supply. So that makes gold inherently the most mm. stable. And the lower the, the lower the supply, for example, something like natural gas or some sort of agricultural product, um, the more the volatility. So um, in its simplest form, that, that holds true. And so therefore, I think gold and silver are the, are the, are the ones that are worth looking at. Platinum in this market, it, it's really doing its industrial thing. And I don't think that the, it, it's going to capture the imagination um, of, of, of the real money pundits through this bull market in the same way that gold and silver would. So our positions are in gold, is our, our biggest one, a more modest one in silver, and then a quite a significant position in gold shares as well. Okay, uh, and uh, Suki, what, what, could you give us a feel for the liquidity of the different precious metals markets? So, for example, c could is it possible for an ETF, uh, or I should probably say the authorised participant of an ETF, to do a hundred million dollar creation without a f having a significant effect on the price? And let's say, let's let's take all the metals in turn. I mean, how, how liquid are the uh, relevant markets? Um, in, in terms of ETF holdings, obviously gold is the largest. Um, across the products that we track, there's around about $130, $140 billion held in the gold products. For silver, yeah. around $13, $14 billion. PGMs, around about a billion each. So the sort of magnitude in terms of flows that we've seen this year 
have been most notable for silver. The flows that we've seen in silver have been a co coupled with the retail interest certainly have been enough to drive prices to record highs. Whereas for gold, the same level of flows is, is, is not, not significant enough alone to move the price. Whereas for PGMs, we really started seeing the outflows following the events in Japan in March and that's capped the upward momentum in prices. So it's really been um, the negative interest in the PGM holdings that's capped the momentum, but it hasn't changed the market dynamics for the longer term basis. We still like Palladium uh, constructively going out to 2012, 2013, just think it's suffering in the near term. In terms of platinum, we've seen a, a subdued positive interest, but it's still been positive. But that's again a market where I think the fundamentals are becoming much more important given the rising cost base from the South African producers and the continued interest we're seeing in terms of Chinese demand for platinum as well. And I'd say those two dynamics are much more important in terms of um, well, the, the flows. Well, okay, Th uh, thank you. Um, it's, uh, Charlie, could you give us your view on tradability and perhaps you could comment on how you've chosen to execute trades in, in your gold and silver uh, ETCs or ETFs, so, you know, how you've done it, to how, how liquid have you found those markets to be? Um, perfectly liquid. I mean, we, we've, we've done trades. I, think, I can't remember what our largest one we've done, but it's you know three hundred million dollars or so, and um, and we've yep. never had a problem executing that with a. Um, you know, we tend to do it at the fix for the for the precious metals. Mm. When we tend to do end of, end of day and AV for, for non precious metals would be our our usual yep. tactic. And, and I don't I don't think we've had a um, any problems with the liquidity. But there again, we've stayed away from markets where we may find a problem, and so like, hence yes. hanging around gold and silver in preference to particularly gold as opposed to PGM. And, and w um, from a portfolio management perspective, how do you how do you look at the precious metals? Uh, I mean, have you analysed correlations going back a long way? And, and uh, are you concerned that they may be becoming more correlated or more inversely correlated, perhaps, to some other asset classes? Or, or you just think it'd be good if you could talk us through your uh, thinking process there? Yeah, well, I think the starting point is we look at gold and then we, we reference everything to gold when it comes to, to precious metals and gold shares and so forth. So let's just talk about mm -hmm. gold. I mean, it's, it, it's been equity correlated. I mean, people, people say it's not correlated to the stock market, but up until the last three months, it's been very correlated mm -hmm. to the stock market. And it might have had good mm -hmm. bear markets and... Uh, and, um, and um, um, quite, sorry, good, good bear markets, equity bear markets, you know, gold's tended to preserve value in the dot-com bear market in 08. Um, and then, of course, mm. in, the, in, the, in the bull markets, it's matched the return of the S&P. But they, those have been mm. correlated events, and we've always taken the view that gold is a risk asset. But from the beginning of, you know, this, this really the last three months, we've started to see gold accelerate, um, and it's actually now mm. for the first time doing the opposite to what the stock market's doing. So there's definitely been a, mm. a, a, a structural change. You know, the fact that gold is negatively correlated isn't particularly exciting, because that means you know, you're owning something that's even more volatile because the stock market, you know, bear markets are very volatile events. The stock market goes mm. down and, and then they have, you know, ferocious bounces. But what, we're, again, we're seeing in the gold price, um, you know, it tends to do quite well at the moment when, when there's a bad day in the stock market, um, but then doesn't seem to be giving much back. But we're definitely on a new mm. trajectory. And so you can, see, you can look at this bull market in three phases, you know, really up until around 06 time, um, then sort of 06 until three months ago. And, and each, you know, in the 11 years of this bull market, the first six or seven, um, were pretty gentle. Then the next three were, um, or three or four were, were you know, were, were a step up. Uh, and now we're in this accelerated price trend. And this is very, very similar to what happened in the Nasdaq in the 80s and 90s. Um, but this final phase won't last long in time, in my, in my opinion, you know, with a technical view. Um, it will last less than yes. two years, one to two years. Um, but the price action could be very strong. So I was going to ask you, when do you think it's going to uh, burn itself out, if that's the right word? You, so you could yeah. see a peak coming by 2013. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, next year will probably be quite fun for the gold market, but at the end of the gold market mm. will probably coincide with the end of the equity bear market. I think that's a, that's a yes. likely scenario. Um, you know, yes. back in 1980, both equities and bonds went down. Sorry, both equity and bonds and gold went down in 1981. So before the new equity yes. bull market began, there was really nowhere yeah. to hide at all. And I think we might mm. go, you know, go into one of those one of those um, situations. But I suppose, you know, looking at what's happening around us, I think you know, if, if the if, if gold sort of enters the mainstream. I really don't believe it has. As I said before, all the, G all the gold ETFs in the world are Vodafone and all the silver mm. ETFs in the world are British Airways. This really is nothing. And um, you know, when, it, when it becomes on everyone's lips and corporations start to diversify their reserves um, and pension funds start to, to take, a, take a, um, a physical slice and all the rest of it, I think these, those are the indicators that we're coming to the end of this bull market.
So we haven't seen the phase of mass public participation yet, in, in your opinion? We, we, we've begun it. I believe we've begun it. As soon as gold broke out above 1600 on this new trend line, then I think this, this mm. is going to last for quite some time. I've no idea what mm. the top is, but I think it's going to be quite a high number. Mm. And, and Suki, perhaps a final question for you. Could you just remind us what the role of the central banks uh, you know, is in the market? What, what are they doing? Um, uh, obviously, Britain, unfortunately, is, we sold out at the worst possible time. But, uh, I mean, it, uh, are they... Uh, you know, the, the flow is uh, substantial in terms of what's happening to price formation. Are they still is there something you monitor closely, and, and what do you see happening there? We've seen uh, flows uh, in terms of the central bank buying this year on a net basis. It's just over 200 tons, and that's quite mm. substantial given that in previous years they were selling up to 400 tons. So in the, in the first instance, it was just important, the fact that we'd removed a source of supply. But now, given that we're seeing um, Mexico bought just under 100 tons, we've seen uh, South Korea buying 25 tons. These are, these are not necessarily um, significant on their own, but collectively, it, it has provided support for the market. When the investment demand was a bit quieter at the start of the year, certainly through February and March, it was the central bank interest that we saw and the physical demand that we saw uh, plugging that gap and the investment demand slowed down a little bit. So it, it's, it's a very substantial move in that it's swung from the supply side to the demand side and the demand side numbers have become quite significant as well. Okay. Well, uh, with that, I think I'll, uh, we, our time is up and uh, I'd like to thank uh, both our panelists, uh, Suki and Charlie, for uh, participating and for sharing their views. I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening in, and uh, we hope you'll uh, join us for our next webinar next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.